told us in your word that we can come boldly before your throne. Because of what Jesus did at Calvary, we have an interest in his love. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much that you gave your only Son. It's almost incomprehensible for us to fathom what that means, what it meant to you, and what it means for us. We come today to worship you. We worship you, the creator of the universe, the holy one, the faithful one. We worship you because of who you are.
pray today for the persecuted church, especially in India. Lord, you know how hard it is for them to serve in that country where there's violence and persecution. Where for them, being a Christian means giving up everything. And they willingly do that. Lord, help us to learn from them. We pray for them and their families. We pray for Christians all around the world, for missionaries, for local churches in other countries, for churches here in Newcastle and our own nation. We pray, Lord, that we might be faithful doing the work you call us to do. You put us on earth for a reason. Help us to glorify you. We pray for our armed forces wherever they are today. We pray for those troops that have been deployed to Europe. We pray for your protection upon them especially, but we pray for protection upon all of our armed forces. Minister to their needs, we pray. And Father, we do thank you for all that you are doing among us. We pray for those in our number who are in need of a touch from you. We pray for Michelle today. We pray for Gary. We pray for Elsie. Pray for Rick, Dick. We pray for those on our prayer list, Lord, that you have been with, that continue to be with. For Jack. Lord, just lift these ones up. Meet their needs today, we pray. Father, we love you. We praise your name. glad you're here. Meet with us and apply to our hearts today that which we need to get us through this coming week. We pray in Jesus' name. chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to be reading two short passages from this chapter, beginning with 17 through 19, and then 26 through 29. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. When he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until... That day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word today. Have you started your Christmas shopping yet? Getting a head start on your baking? Are you getting prepared? Some people that I know, they hit the after Christmas sales, usually the day after Christmas, looking for those bargains on wrapping paper. 
and all of those things. Preparing for Christmas begins early and lasts long. But the real question I want to ask today is, are you preparing for Easter? Are you preparing for Easter? Why is it that we put so much emphasis on Christmas and so much less time <clears throat> on celebrating the greatest event in history when Jesus Christ our sacrificial lamb, our Savior, rose again from the grave, from the dead. Lent is a six-week period of self-sacrifice, prayer, and acts of service to prepare for Easter. Some among us today are more familiar with that than others. Some of you maybe have been raised in a tradition where you observed Lent by sacrificing or fasting certain meals, or perhaps you gave up something for Lent. Others of us perhaps never, ever participated in that way. Maybe some have begun to do that late, later in life. We don't know. It's really not something that we look at Scripture and say, this you must do. It's not something that Jesus commanded us to do, but church tradition and the church liturgical calendar has provided for these different seasons of the year, which I think are interesting at the least and important as well, to help us to focus our lives throughout the year and focus on why we exist and what we are to do as Christ followers. While family celebrations may consist of a, a few Easter baskets, a new outfit, and maybe a big meal, this, this season reminds us to prepare ourselves spiritually. To prepare ourselves not only for the next six weeks, but for all of the year, 24, 7, 365, we need to be prepared spiritually. Today is the first Sunday of Lent. Lent lasts 46 days. Four days, or 40 days rather, and then there are the six Sundays. So it lasts for 46 days. As we begin today to think about this season, we're going to talk about preparing today. And let's focus on some preparations that Jesus set in motion. As we read these short paragraphs from Matthew 26, Jesus, first of all, prepared for the observance of the Passover with his disciples. Probably more than any other time of the year, Christmas and Easter are times that when I look at Scripture, I try to put myself into the period of the time and what it would be like perhaps to live in those days, what actually took place, because we, we read over scripture, we gloss over it. Unfortunately, we're guilty of doing that at times and not making any accusations or judgment, judgment comments to anybody else, but more, more so to myself, that we can be very perfunctory when we read scripture, just read it through and say, I got my chapter in or I got my passage in for today. But you think about just what took place. The Passover, as we know from back in the book of Exodus, when it was instigated, instituted, the Israelites would observe this Passover meal every year to remind them of being loosed from Pharaoh's control. And so, when they observed the Passover, it would require extensive preparation. It wasn't, if you think about it, when Jesus said, I want to, I want to observe the Passover with, and eat with his disciples, it didn't, it didn't, it just didn't walk in and sit down and say, okay, here it is. There had to be some preparation. They had to roast a lamb that was sacrificed earlier in the day. 
They would prepare the bread, the bitter herbs, the wine. All of these things had to be done in order for them to come together and observe the Passover feast. The room itself had to be swept clean according to tradition and carefully cleansed from every particle of anything that was considered leaven. And this was not a simple task. So when the disciples asked Jesus, where do you want us to prepare this? They were asking, we better get started. And Jesus gave those instructions. We read in the other Gospels as well, that Jesus said to his disciples that he eagerly desired to eat it with them. When I discovered that nuance of that verse some time ago, it, it really struck me because it wasn't that Jesus just observed Passover with the disciples, but he said, I eagerly desire to do this with you. I, I really am looking forward to this. This is something very important for me to do this. In Luke chapter 22, it says, When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. There was something special about this Passover. Although Jesus, no doubt, observed Passover every year with his disciples, this time it was different. He knew that it would be the last time that he would observe it before he died. He knew what was coming, and he cherished observing it with his closest friends. This was going to be a special Passover. When we observe communion, at the appointed times that we designate for that, it ought to be something that we look forward to. It's something that I would hope that we would come to church expecting, especially because it's Communion Sunday. I know that my growing up years, I would, I would go to church and then when I get there, I would notice the elements on the table. And for a child growing up in the church that I grew up in, that just meant church was going to go longer and longer. <laughs> I'd walk into church and I'd, oh, it's communion Sunday. Didn't know ahead of time. Didn't prepare ahead of time. But you know, it, it, when we think about it, if we come to gather together, and the neat thing we have here is we have you friends to eat it with. Just like Jesus had his friends. When he had his disciples, it was his closest, closest followers, they ate it together. And we have the opportunity today to come together and, and you look to the people beside you and later on when we pass the elements, you're going to be passing it to one another and, and you do that and you say, wow, I get to do this with you. I get to do this with my, my friend who's sitting beside me. Those behind me, those in front of me. We're here together to partake together. Observing communion with our church family is significantly special. The opportunity we have today to participate together. If you're watching by video today or live stream on Facebook, you can't be with us in person, but you know, you're still here in spirit. And those who may be with you and participating together, if you're not alone in your home, you have a chance to observe just what we're talking about here among those who are gathered in the church building. Jesus made ready for the observance. The disciples were told, they were directed to a, a certain man who, who would solve a logistical issue. Where do you go when you don't have a home to prepare the Passover in? How do you do this? And Jesus said the Son of Man had no place to put his head. He was dependent upon other people. And probably a lot of outdoor camping. But to have a Passover, he directed the disciples to go to a certain man. Someone who 
God had prepared ahead of time. For there was no argument. The teacher says his appointed time has come and is going to eat the Passover in your house, in your location, an upper room, perhaps attached to a house that the man owned, or maybe it was a, a rental property, I don't know. But Jesus directed them to him. Jesus conveyed the message that his appointed time was near, and it's not, some, some would look at that and say, well, the, the Passover is near, the time of the Passover is here. But I don't think that's what it meant here, right? Many scholars believe that it, what Jesus is saying is his appointed time to be arrested and die and go to the cross is near. It's coming. And this is what's going to take place on this occasion. Jesus prepared. For the Passover. He also prepared a new covenant for us. He prepared us to remember his death. He did something for us that day, that night, that we identify more closely with on Monday, Thursday, when it gets close to Holy Week and close to Easter. He prepared us that night for all those who come after to remember his death. This event is described as Jesus instituting the, the Lord's Supper during the Passover meal. He, he took the Passover, which was a familiar meal to all the devout Jews, and he said, this is something special now. I'm making this new. He instituted what we call the Lord's Supper today, or communion. Some refer to da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper. This all took place, and Jesus prepared us today for his death, to remember it. Paul wrote in the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that when he did this, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you do remember my death. You demonstrate my death until I come. The bread is his body. Some verses of scripture say it is broken for you. Others use the word given for you. Either way is accurate. I, I like a more modern word given here because he gave his body for us. The, the interesting thing about Jesus' body, although it was pierced and so the skin was certainly broken and all of that took place, the Bible tells us that not a bone in his body was broken. And they came on the crosses to, to hurry up the sacrifice on that day on Good Friday and they broke the legs of the malefactors being crucified beside Jesus to hasten along but when they came to Jesus they did not do that remember they said they saw he was already dead and so they did not break his bone not a bone in his body was broken but he was given for us He gave thanks for the bread and gave it to his disciples. It's, again, it's something we take so much for granted. We, we pass the plates at our meals. We pass things when we eat. We pass the communion trays and we pass the elements and we take it and pass it on and all those things. And not by any means lightening the, this, 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 the, the, the sacredness of this, but there is more to it than just giving it away, giving it to somebody else. By distributing the bread to his disciples, he, can, he symbolically conveyed that the benefits of what was taking place, what would take place on the cross, was being extended 
to all who receive it. But as many as received him, John wrote, to them gave he the right to be called the children of God. Wow. He was saying, this is for you. I convey it to you. Take it with you. From now on, and every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death. The cup contained the blood of the covenant. He said, the fruit of the vine that was in this cup was a new testament he was making with them. A new covenant that was shed for many. To them who were gathered in that room, he would say to you, each of you, to you and you and you and you, it was shed for you and by extension we can say to you and you and you and you and me here in this room and in our homes who are watching that to each of us, to each of us, his blood was shed for us. His blood was shed for us. For the forgiveness of sins. Because it's necessary, and Scripture tells us over and over again that it's necessary that blood be shed for the atonement. That's why they sacrificed animals from the time of the flood, after the flood, until Jesus went to the cross. Animals had to be sacrificed. He replaced that with his own body. He was the sacrificial lamb. He was the lamb that was slain for all the world. He also prepared us for kingdom eternity. Jesus, on that night that he was betrayed, after they had taken the Passover and eaten the Passover and, and he instituted this new covenant, they went out from there. It says they sang a hymn, which was traditional in a Passover meal, to sing this hymn. And then they went out. And as they went out to the Mount of Olives, on the way there, Jesus continued to teach them. I look at it as like a crash course. The last minute things he wanted them to know because in, in a few hours, he was not going to even be able to talk to them anymore. So he was telling them a lot of things. And one of the things he told them was that not your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's what he's doing. He's preparing a place for us. I think it's so significant that when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, he reminded his disciples that he's going to prepare a place so that where he is, they may be also. Thomas says, well, what are you talking about? How do we know where you're going to be? How will we know the way? You remember Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He also promised that he, we would, he would partake of this meal not now, not anymore on earth, but when he eats it or drinks it new with us in his Father's kingdom. This is likely a reference to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9, we have these words. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. The bride being you and me, the church. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her, given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. 
Then the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. Jesus prepared for the Passover. He prepared not just for a meal. He didn't do this just to make sure that everything was perfect for the Passover. Jesus went through himself. He went through the process of preparing you and me by extension for what well was to come. And during this Lenten season, it's helpful to us to pause. I know we're busy. I know our schedules make us are, are very crazy and we, we work hours, long hours and we go places and we have to get this done and that done and we sometimes wonder when is it going to stop? But for us as Christ followers today, as we begin the Lenten season, we need to stop and remember to prepare ourselves to be humble. To be humble. That's why many churches, traditions put ashes on the forehead to remind people of humility. To remind people that they're mournful for their sins. To, to sacrifice. To, to give up. I don't think there's anything magic about that, but I know if we fast a meal or if we give up something for a period of time, every time we miss it, it helps us remember why we're doing it. And the focus turns to Jesus, turns to Christ, turns to God, turns to spiritual things. So if we do that, if we do it, if we don't, it's fine, but if we do that, then we Remember. And during this time, it's also a time of, of almsgiving, as they say. Of service. Do something for someone else. Because of what Jesus did for you. As Christ followers, we ought to be striving every day to grow in our faith as we seek to become more and more like Jesus. Jesus knew that we easily forget. He, he knew what our minds would be like today. He knew what all of you seniors go through when you forget why you went in that room for something. He knows that it happens, doesn't he? And even if you're not a senior, if you're a younger person, you may remember a lot of stuff, but we oftentimes forget our spiritual obligation. We sometimes forget what we really should be doing. And so, as we go on the spiritual journey, Jesus knew we'd forget. So he established a new covenant that ensures the forgiveness of our sins. A, a new covenant that said because of his death on the cross, we would be forgiven for our sins. And he reminds us of this every time we celebrate communion together. So I encourage you to, and myself, all of us, to take advantage of opportunities like this season of Lent to prepare ourselves spiritually for what Easter means to us. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your, your sacrifice of your Son, for his death on the cross on our behalf, that we might have eternal life, that we may live with you forever and ever in that place that Jesus is preparing for us right now. Oh, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus' sacrifice and that we can pause today and remember. We ask you to be with us, especially right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that of all the things the church does, all the things that we do, having church services, prayer meetings, 
youth groups, children's ministries, VBSs, visitation, all these things that we do, there's nothing more sacred than this few minutes we gather together around the table of the Lord. There's nothing more sacred than pausing right now and forgetting everything else that's going on in the world around us and just remember Jesus and what he did for us. Paul said in the Corinthians letter when he talked about this observance, he said that we should examine ourselves and be sure that we don't have a hindrance among us in us that would prevent us from worshiping the Lord cleanly, cleansed from all unrighteousness. That's why we confess our sins. Why we try to take a moment in the service during the pastoral prayer to just do that so that we don't carry those into the communion service. So I'm going to ask right now that we just bow in prayer, silent prayer to the Lord that we would just ask him, first of all, to remove from us anything that would hinder us from seeing him right now. Just to, there will be no distractions. And then also to say to the Lord, Lord, you know these sins I committed this week, maybe even this morning. And Lord, I just want you to forgive me for this. I repent of it. I ask you, Lord, to help me not to do it again. You know I'm weak. You know that we are sometimes prone to do the things we shouldn't do. So just tell the Lord. He knows. He hears. And he'll take care of it. So just take a moment right now as we just remind, remain in silent prayer. Talk to the Lord on your behalf. Jesus, thank you for being that advocate between us and the Father. Thank you for being the one to whom we come for forgiveness. Thank you for your forgiveness today. to help us serve this morning. <clears throat> if you're visiting with us today, you're welcome to participate with us. In our tradition, we don't have a closed communion. It's open. There's only one scriptural requirement. The scriptural requirement is that we know the Lord and that our hearts are right with Him. And so, if that's true in your life, we invite you to participate. We welcome you to participate. Do you understand the elements that we are about to partake of? I know that you may be from a different tradition. In our church, we believe that the bread represents as a symbol the body of Christ. It is not in our theology that says that the bread actually becomes the body of Christ. I know in other traditions it may. We believe that the cup, the 
juice that we use is a symbol of the blood of Jesus. But it does not become the blood, as some traditions teach it. This is not to criticize anybody else, let's just say this is what our tradition is. So we believe today that <clears throat> as we had this opportunity to take the bread and take the cup, being reminded of Jesus' death until he comes again, we will hold in our hands a symbol of the very body of blood of Jesus Christ, which was given for us, shed on the cross for us, that we might have eternal life. Jesus said on another occasion, I am the bread of life. Bread was very common. It's a very common part of a meal. In fact, in many cases, it was almost the whole meal. It was filling. Jesus fed 5,000 plus people, maybe up to 15,000 people, some, some surmise, with just five loaves and two fish. He broke it and blessed it and multiplied it. Jesus used that bread to teach. And people came to him. They, they, they sought him out. After all, they got to eat. Their, heart, their stomachs were full to their heart's content. And they wanted more of this. And Jesus says, you're only coming because you, you got to eat. Really, the truth is, unless you eat of my body, and that you, you partake of me, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. Well, that that turned them off. Many, it says, many, many left him that day. They couldn't accept that teaching. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He's telling you and me today, I am the bread of life. I am your life. Why? Because a few hours after he said that, he went to the cross and they nailed his hands to the beam. He nailed his feet to a stool on that upright. Punctured his skin and he began to bleed. And his bleeding went out of his body and cleansed every sin that I've ever committed and you've ever committed. He, he cleansed every sin that you could ever commit in the future. Because he's already done it. He did it once and for all. So there's nothing more he can do. So everything that happens in our spiritual journey, when we stumble, when we fall, Jesus took care of our day. Isn't that wonderful news? He gave his blood, gave his body, and shed his blood for you and for me. So, Father, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus. The words thank you are inadequate, but we say them to you anyhow for going to the cross for us. It should have been us on that cross, but it was you instead. Thank you for doing this for us. Thank you for what it means, what it represents for us in our lives. We pray in your name. Amen. We're using these individual containers of bread and juice. And as you receive it, if you've not participated with this in this way before, the smaller end has a tear-off piece of paper and in it is a wafer to represent the blood, the bread. And we'll partake together when we can serve it all. And then when we do the cup, we turn it upside down and we take the paper off there and we have the juice. It's easy to do. Just pull that tab off. If you have difficulty, I'm sure someone beside you would be glad to assist you.
serve and retain the cup until all have been served and will partake together. We read that on that night, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he gave thanks. And he said, as he gave to his disciples, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat, you all. like manner, he took the cup. One of the several cups that were part of the Passover meal, but he said, this cup is a new covenant I make with you, a new testament. 
And in this covenant with you, I am saying to you, my blood, not the blood of animals, but my blood will cover all your sins. It'll take away the sins of the world. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Drink you up. tried to comprehend how deep the Father's love for us is? Have you ever just stopped and got alone with God and said, help me to grasp this. Help me to grasp how deep that love is to send Jesus to the cross. Let's sing together how deep the Father's love
Two weeks from today, we'll be having our annual business meeting. The packets and information are available at the information center with all the reports in them. We encourage you to take those and read them. They've been prepared to be read, not to just be ignored, which I know many times that happens, but please read them and uh, be prepared for the meetings as we come together. If you're not a member of the church, you're still allowed to take one. Know more about our church, that's fine. But we do encourage all the members to be here on the 20th of March. Following the worship service, we'll take a short break and then come together for our annual business meeting. And uh, that will be all explained in the agenda. Some pastors are quickly organizing the prayer vigil Friday night this week at 6 o'clock for World Peace. I don't know how you're viewing what's going on today. I, I realize that there have been conflicts in the world before, and there will be others probably. 
But I believe that we're seeing unfolding in our very, before our very eyes the stuff that I used to hear in church when I was a kid this big about the end times. And this is serious. And I, I, I hope that we're praying. You see, the goals in that uh, I'm going to be away on Friday. I'm not going to be here. I regret that because I will participate. But it's going to be at the River Walk on Friday at 6 o'clock. If it's in climate weather, it may be at the Confluence or at Trinity Episcopal Church. But I'm sure if you keep your eyes open and tuned to Facebook or whatever, you'll find out those information, that information if it's changed. But I'm inviting you to participate in that. Represent uh, the church and your, your, uh, the Lord in this prayer vigil. I'm going to ask our offer to lay upon us for our morning offering of tithes and gifts. If you're visiting with us, we don't ask you to feel any obligation to, uh, to participate. It's a membership responsibility. But we do welcome the gifts of the congregation. Father, we do thank you for providing for us, for meeting our needs. Receive this offering, we pray. In Jesus' name. It's always exciting to see people who have fellowship with us and have decided that they want to become a formal member of the church. With that comes responsibilities, not only to just attend the service, but to, to support the church and volunteering, and faithful attendance, and giving. It's a great responsibility. It's also a great privilege. Members are not treated any different than non-members in our church. We don't single them out and say they're special. They are, but so are everybody else. But they're here today to stand before you and say, we've chosen to become a member of this church. One thing that struck me in preparing for today is that it's only by grace. It's only by grace that we do this. It's only by grace that God has brought us to a place in our lives, young or old, that we can identify with his body in a formal way. And so these have come today. We want to welcome them into the fellowship. 
<clears throat> Timothy standing right close to me. I guess I'll start with Tim. Tim is a great young man. Got to know him a bit as he's been attending the youth group and church when he's not working and he works a lot. He's a responsible guy. He's got a responsible dad, good dad, Albert, and uh, raised him well, and mom as well. We just welcome you today. And then, you know, Tim, there's a verse of scripture. I've used it many times especially for younger people when they come to this place because uh, you look like you're 30, but you're not. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember my church down in Kentucky used to always pray for me to make me wise beyond my years. And uh, I, uh, I don't know how to take that sometimes when I was young, a young pastor, but you are wise beyond your years. You're mature. And you're a great guy. And this verse of scripture, one day it came to me in a new way. It's in 1 Timothy. It's kind of appropriate. It says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Don't take a second, second place for anybody because you're young. That's what Paul is telling Timothy in the Bible. You're young, but you're, you're mature. You're, you're, you're doing these things. And on the same, but set an example <clears throat> for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. What that says to me, Tim, is that you have a place to set an example for me and all is gathered here. You can be an example to us as a young guy. As you serve the Lord through the church however you can. You give and support the church however you can. And you, you live your life in a pure way. In faith. You represent the Lord wherever you go. And as a member of the church, you in a way you represent us too. Sheets of good, glad to have you. <laughs> and you guys have to represent the Lord there. So, Tim, I present the certificate to you of membership with great joy because you're a great guy. Andy and Diane <clears throat> used to attend the church many years ago. Their life took them elsewhere for a while. And uh, they came back. It's exciting to see them. I remember the Sunday they walked into church. I was like, wow, it's been a long time. And uh, their children were in our youth group growing up. They're all married and got children of their own, most of them. And they're in youth groups, aren't they? <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting how it all works and came full circle. And Diane, <clears throat> the youth group for you was very important when you were a teenager. You said that your, you and your sister were the only ones your family went to church, basically. And the youth group, I mean, we want you to hear this, the youth group was something that really showed Christ light to you. That's something that's amazing. It wasn't the preacher. It wasn't the elders and all the older people in the church, but the youth group demonstrated Christ's light to you. And look where it brought you. With the faith in Jesus Christ and to bring you to a place where you can be serving him. Spend eternity with him. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. The Spirit kind of took me to this verse when I thought about that part of your testimony. It says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Kind of describes that youth group, doesn't it? Kind of describes your interaction with them and your experience. It goes on to say this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. That's what we are, just jars of clay. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God you have now a wonderful responsibility to take what that youth group did for you those years ago and translate that into serving him wherever God takes you. Andy, you're a blessing. One of the things that you said as you met with the elders <clears throat> And you summed up the whole process. You said, we've come home. We've come home. I like, I like that. I'm glad you feel this is home for you. I hope it's home for all of us. In the book of Zephaniah, the verse I have for you is this. Chapter 3, verse 20. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Congregation, please stand. I'm going to pray a prayer over these ones. And we're going to invite the church board and the elders to come and extend the right hand of fellowship to them. And in following this service, I trust the rest of you members will do the same thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Timothy, for Diane, and for Andy for the relationship that is taking a different turn today that continues in the fellowship of the Church of Genesis. Father, your blessing in their lives is what we desire. I ask you to make them a blessing to all of us as we all serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can't be seen while we do this, you may do so. Just a few more moments, you may dismiss.